Good morning, Cross Point Church. My name is Joshua Robertson, and I'm the campus pastor of the Midtown Church that is yet launching right now. And I'm glad to be here this morning to share with you in worship. And I just pray that these next few moments will be filled with the presence of God so that the people of God can look like the Son of God to the glory of God. If you don't mind, let me pray one more time over this time of feasting on the Word of God for myself to preach the Word of God with power and conviction. Let's pray. Father, we come to you as your children to hear from your Word to guide our lives. Open up our hearts and our minds to understand and drink from your wonderful truths. Bless us. Make us one. In Christ's name we believe and pray. Amen. Today we are starting our series on healthy habits. And today is the first installment and we will key in and focus on this topic of vision. Having a vision for your life. In 1776 there was a vision for a battleship that is now named the USS Philadelphia. People came together, brought their resources together, and bought the materials needed for this battleship to fight in the American Revolutionary War. Tragically, history tells us that this ship was captured, and for years it sat at the bottom of the ocean. In 1935, the Smithsonian Institution rediscovered this ship, this ship that was 1,240 tons and was a gunship, is now an artifact in Washington, D.C. The original vision for this battleship was that it would fight. Instead, now it's an artifact that is admired by tourists from near and far. In Matthew 28, Jesus gives the church marching orders that the church would go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching new disciples to obey the commands of the Lord. And he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The church's vision initially was to fight for the kingdom of God in the earth. The question I ask, are we like the USS Philadelphia that is admired by tourists? Or are we what God envisioned for his church to be? A battleship that is fighting for the kingdom of God. This starts with vision. Are you fulfilling the vision that God has put in your heart? Or have you veered? Have you grown weary and well-doing? That's the question that I pose today. Only you and the Holy Spirit can answer that question. It, my wife, at the top of the year, she said, babe, let's go to the next level in our marriage. In order for us to have the testimony that we've done that, we're going to have to be consistent, disciplined, and stay on the course. Vision requires discipline. And a healthy person, a healthy person, knows where you're going has a vision. A healthy person has a vision. In fact, Scripture tells you this, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Uh, people that have a vision for life don't waste their time fighting temporal battles. It, a congregation like this right now could be polarized, Democratic and Republican, if we're not careful. Things that 
will eventually go unspoken of. If you look through the Old Testament, just sometimes just for your own, you know, good time, just glance through the book of Numbers and you'll see the Hittites and the Jebusites and the, all the termites, whatever. <laughs> kingdoms that had rose and kingdoms that are no more. What's eternal is the vision that God puts in our hearts. Everything else fades away. This culture as we know it today will fade away, so don't invest too much in it. Instead, stay focused on the vision that God places in our heart. Here it is. The Holy Spirit guides that vision. You're going to see through this biblical text a model for how to stay focused on the vision that God gives you. You'll see it. It starts in verse 14. Do you have your Bibles open? Nudge your neighbor and say, wake up. Get your Bible open. Pull out your smartphone. Right, right now you got to lean in on that double shot of espresso, you know. Look at verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, what? Filled with what? The Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read the scriptures. What I want you to see about this is Jesus practiced as a custom to come to the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. That was a part of how he fulfilled his vision. The saying is, no man is an island, no one stands alone. The first century church would not have ever imagined being a Christian and not being a part of a church. That's what it meant to be a Christian. You were a part of the community. They had no such notion of this building that we have here. When they thought of church, they thought of my brother. They thought of my sister. And here it is. If you're going to live out God's vision for your life, you're going to need your brother and sister. Let me tell you why. Sometimes you just need someone to say God loves you. You need to hear it from another mouth. Sometimes you're going to need someone to come alongside of you and say, I believe you can do it. No man is an island. No man stands alone. Sometimes you will need your brother and your sister who believes in the same Christ you believe in to pray with you, to cry with you, to sing with you, to dance with you. That's why we all need each other. Jesus made it his practice to visit the temple every Lord's Day. And friends, if in 2017 you're going to fulfill your vision, guess what? I need you and you need me. We're all a part of God's body, right? Look at the text. Watch what happens. He gets to the temple, and this was customary in the temple. They would read the scriptures, and this day... The ruler of the temple, he picks up the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. He hands it to Jesus. Jesus unrolls the scroll and found the place where his vision statement, mission statement was already ready for the people to read and enjoy. What happens? You see what Jesus' vision is. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? So that I can dance and sing and, and shake. And, no, no, no. He has anointed me to what? Bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captains will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Look look at what this text is saying. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has gifted me. He has put his presence on me to bring good news. You know what the good news is, friends? The good news of Jesus Christ. You you, you know what that means? It's the message of salvation. It tells a person, here it is, that you can be delivered from where you're at. 
Where are you? What needs deliverance in your life? You may be in a troubled marriage. You need good news. You may be wondering where your children are. Are they in right standing with God? You need good news. You may live in a community that is impoverished and that crime surrounds it. You need deliverance. You may have more money than the bank but can't sleep at night. You need deliverance. God can bless you in more than one way than just money, can he? He he can do that. He can give you joy unspeakable. He can give you the peace that passes all understanding. That's the good news of what only Jesus Christ can do. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, is able to penetrate any circumstance of life and bring good news to it. And that was his mission. That's why he wants our space in our heart today is to give us good news. So don't give up on your vision. No matter where you are at in it, Christ comes to bring what? Good news. Now, if y'all preach with me, nudge your neighbor and say, wake up. If y'all preach with me, we can be done here in a few minutes. Otherwise, you know, my natural sermon time is three hours, but I can tailor it (laughs) to the next 15 minutes if you preach with me. Good news, right? (laughs) He sent me to do what? Proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see. Watch what happens. I I, I look at, and you all have to just walk with me for a minute. I'm from the inner city, Harrisburg, and I grew up in some rough parts. And, And something that I realize is that people that have vision... Don't murder. People that have vision don't swindle folks. People that have vision, purpose, uh, they're able to live disciplined lives because they have something they're working towards. Jesus comes to get captives release, to open up blinded eyes. Sometimes people are blinded because they don't have a vision for where they're going. They're running in circles because they don't know where they're going. They don't know how to get there. They can't map out a plan. And in the midst of people being lost, hurt, despondent, Jesus comes down to earth. All of us at one point whether you call yourself a Christian or a non-Christian, all of us at one point were estranged from God and Christ came into our circumstance to give us God's vision for how to live a life that God would be pleased with. All of us have been there. All of us may be there today and all of us will surely face that in the future. You will have times where your vision will get a little murky. You will have times where life will become dim. We're the light of God. You need the light of Christ to come in your space. And this is what Christ came to do. This was his vision. This was his missional statement that was in the book of Isaiah chapter 61 and 1. Look what happens. That the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor have come. You you know, Jesus had a healthy sense of social justice. He, he, He looked out for people that were marginalized. He looked out for people that were on the borders, who people had forgot about. The question is, who are you lifting a helping hand to today? Who who do you know that really can't help themselves right now that you can inconvenience yourself for? And here it is. People need more than a check. People need more than money. People need a body. The same way you need a hug, the same way you may be, have your arm wrapped around your love right now. Someone somewhere needs that arm of love wrapped around them. That's what Jesus did. You, you see it at the well with a woman who was struggling, who, who came there for just a simple drink of water. Just something that could temporarily help her thirst. And here Jesus comes as a living well 
for her to tap into. That's what Jesus does. He comes and joins people who are on the margins. But watch it. In a higher, holier, and heavier way, that's what he does for our souls. Who are on the margins of sin and iniquity. Who all of us have those secrets, those things we want no one to find out about. Jesus comes to that place and said there's deliverance from that. We would hate right now for on these monitors for it to be displayed, the stuff that we deal with that no one knows anything about. Here it is. God knows. The scripture says he knows our thoughts are far off. God knows what you don't tell people. But God doesn't want you to live on the margins of sin and iniquity. He comes to bring deliverance to those things. That you can't help, that you know, the can't help it's and the can't get rights. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That was his purpose. That was his mission. Jesus had just came out of the wilderness. The spirit led him there for prayer and fasting for 40 days and to be tempted of the devil. He comes to the temple on the Lord's day. He opens up the scroll and here he sees his vision statement for life that had everything to do with helping someone else. How does your vision for 2017 include help for someone else? Does it include inconveniencing yourself for the benefit of someone else? Watch what happens. He rolls up the scroll, verse number 20. He says, that's enough. He made his third point. Rolls up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down, and all the eyes looked at him in the synagogue. And then they begin to speak to them. And look at what Jesus says. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. He drops the mic and said, this scripture is talking about me. This is, this is me. Come here. This message is talking about you. This is not the week to say, I know someone who doesn't have a vision for their life, and I wish they were here. No, 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 no. This message is for you. It was tailor-made for you. So the question is, where is Jesus sending you? Jesus sends us into 2017. The question is, where will you go? I, I can just drop the mic right there, but <laughs> boom, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Where, where will you go? When the Lord does his judgment and he looks back at 2017, will you be an artifact that people come to on a weekly basis to tour and look at? Or will you be the battleship that he designed us to be? That's the question. When the Lord comes back, will you be found doing what he called you to do? Or will you be distracted? Will you be thrown off your course? Will you allow the culture to intoxicate you so much that you can't do what God has called you to do? Friends, I come to you as your brother. This is this is the question that we all have to look at today, square in the eye. Before we really launch into 2017, the question is, what's your vision? What's your vision in your home? What's your vision for your marriage? What's your vision for your children? What's your vision for your grandchildren? What's your vision for your church? Will you be a part of the mission trips? What, what, what small group can you contribute to, not just gain something from, contribute to? What cause can you join an effort to? How can you extend a helping hand? That's what Jesus did. That's the question. Where 
will you go? There's a line right there. And I just want to give you a few minutes of silence. Sometimes we don't allow our day to give us those gifts of moments of silence so we can hear God. We get so busy after this. Some of you can already smell the dinner that is preparing for Sunday's meal. Some of you already know what's on the menu at the restaurant you plan to go to for brunch. Some of you are already in Monday morning thinking about the things you have to do and the to-do list you know is waiting for you. But can you give the next few moments just a few moments of silence? Some of our youth are going back to school today, traveling. I know Daniel Brochers is going back to Penn State today. And I'm proud of him, but I'm proud of him. Godly proud of him. But just like him, he needs a moment too to just be still and hear what God is saying to you. Let's just give a few moments. I just want you to be still and give it a few moments. Where will you go? For your goodness and mercy, dear God, we give you thanks and praise. Thank you for looking beyond our faults and seeing our dire need for you. Thank you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. And we ask you, I ask you, dear God, that you would impress on our hearts a vision for what you want each individual in this room to do this year starting today. And then, God, I ask you that you would charge each heart in here to not go to church, but to be the church, to be a body of brothers and sisters that love one another, that will encourage one another, that will support one Another, help us to be that, not just say that. Thank you for giving us a community, a community full of love and compassion, a community full of responsibility and accountability. Thank you. In your wise providence, you knew we needed your church. So we thank you. We bless you, we love you, and bless the work of our hands in 2017. Bless the vision that you're giving us even today. In Christ's name, we believe and pray these things. And the people of God said, amen.